Welcome to the second jog pod of the Carbon Cycle and Energy Security. So if you haven't watched EQ1 of this topic, please go back and watch it on the YouTube channel. This one is EQ2, looking at the consequences for people and the environment of our increasing demand for energy. So please use your Carbon Cycle Revision booklet as you go through this video. And remember, again, this is not replacing what you've learned in lessons. This is just supporting your revision and is a revision tool for you in the run-up to your A-levels. So let's start by looking at energy security and consumption then. And there are four key aspects to creating energy security. The availability of energy, the accessibility of it, the affordability of it and cost price, and also the reliability of that energy source as well. Now, sources of energy vary country to country. And there are distinctions between different types of sources. There is domestic and foreign sources of energy. So domestic is in-house, in the land, and foreign is from other nations around the world. And then there are primary and secondary sources of energy as well. Now, primary sources of energy are found in nature, but they don't need to be converted to be used, such as wind or oil. And secondary sources need to be converted. These things like the electricity grid and electricity in general. Oh, there are a number of factors that affect the amount of consumption an area or region or country will have per capita. And they include the actual availability physically of energy, the cost of it, the standard of living in that country and level of development, the environmental priorities and policies of the government of that nation, the climate, the public's perception on energy use. And finally, technology and how advanced technology is in using some of these energy sources. So that is a list of what actually impacts the amount of energy used in a nation. Now, there are two case studies you must look at in this topic, and they include the USA and France. And I'm going to briefly summarise for you here what the main elements of energy use in those two nations are. So first of all, on screen, you've got two pie charts. We can see the USA energy consumption categorized on the left and France's energy consumption categorized on the left. There are very key differences between the USA and France. First of all, notably, the USA's energy mix is much more varied than France's. So the USA doesn't rely heavily on one or two sources of energy. It has a good mix of at least four sources of energy, notably in the USA, oil, gas, coal and nuclear. Although hydroelectric, hydroelectric power and renewable energies in the USA is small, currently it is growing. And so the USA is sent to be quite energy, energy secure because it does have a good varied mix of different types of energy and it's self-sufficient. France, on the other hand, has invested heavily in the last 20 to 30 years on nuclear energy. And that can be very clearly seen then in this pie chart where 70 percent roughly of all of the electricity sources in France are from nuclear power. Now, that comes with its advantages and its disadvantages as well. France also does rely somewhat on gas and wind energy. Obviously, wind energy being the more progressive of those types of energies. But France's main source of energy, as I said, is nuclear. Now, to summarise all of that briefly on screen for you now is just some characteristics of the USA and France's energy consumption statistics. So the USA is second in the world for energy consumption because it has a population of 310 million, whereas France is 10th in the world and has a population of 65 million, roughly the same as the UK's. In the USA, three quarters of all of its energy comes from fossil fuels. Now, you can argue that that is not good at all in terms of a progressive green type policy movement. Of course, it's not. But the key thing here is that they're self-sufficient in it and it's readily available and they are very energy and energy secure, therefore. Whereas France, 25 percent of its energy comes from fossil fuels. Now, that's better in an environmental sense and 70 percent comes from nuclear power, but half of its primary energy is imported. And that means it's reliant upon other nations to provide it with energy sources and supply. And that means, therefore, it is less energy secure overall. 
So now we're going to look at the role of energy players. So to start off with, we need to think about the route energy takes. OK, and an energy pathway is the route taken by any form of energy from source to consumption. So the following players are responsible for energy pathways and have the ability to change and be in charge of the route of energy from source to consumption. So TNCs to start with, big brands like Shell, Gazprom and ExxonMobil. 50% of the top companies for energy particularly are state owned and therefore under government control. So in a way, they're almost not TNCs, they're almost government companies. And these are involved in a range of operations such as extracting energy at source, refining it and transporting it and selling it as well. We then have the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries, otherwise known as OPEC. And OPEC currently has 13 member states owning 767% of all of the world's oil. So it owns three quarters of the world's oil, or sorry, two thirds of the world's oil um, supply. And it's in a position, therefore, to control supply quite a lot and to essentially disrupt markets when those 13 member states so wish, as well as structure the pricing of oil. And OPEC, therefore, has been accused of inflating prices by limiting the amount of supply it is offering to worldwide nations as well. So that's another company or representative that's involved in the energy pathway and can affect the energy pathway. Next, we have the energy companies themselves. So these convert primary energy like oil and gas into electricity and then distribute it to our homes. They have considerable power and influence over consumers in setting prices. We then have consumers, which of which the most influential consumers would be transport industries and um, industry itself and manufacturing and also domestic users in homes. But consumers are largely passive players in fixing energy prices and we can't really have much of an effect over the price base of energy and electricity, apart from moving providers, moving energy companies to make them more competitive and to get the best energy deals. And finally, governments then. Governments can be what are seen as guardians of national security, security in terms of energy, and therefore they can influence the sources of energy they use for geopolitical reasons, and they can therefore change the supply chain entirely as well. So those five players in the energy pathway play a key role individually in changing the way energy gets from source to consumer and the route it takes. Now, there is a major problem with supply and demand in the world. Despite concerns over carbon emissions and climate change and global warming, 86% of the world's primary energy supply is still fossil fuel based. So 86% at least of world energy is still non-renewable and environmentally damaging. Supply is determined by processes such as climate, biomass, faulting, continental drift, etc. All of these things affect the amount of supply we have available to us. So there's just some examples for coal, oil and gas here then of the mismatch. So Asia, particularly China, has the world's largest coal production, matching its world's largest consumption. So they produce a lot and they use a lot. Europe produces little coal today, but still demands 15% of the world's supply. So you can see there that Europe doesn't really produce much, but demands 15%. So there's a mismatch in terms of the amount of coal needed. We also have oil here then. So North America's oil supply is around 20% of the world's, yet it needs 24% and uses 24%. The Middle East supplies 31%, yet Asia demands 34% and China is 12% of that alone. So China, Asia demand a heavy, a, a third of the world's oil supplies, yet they don't actually produce a third of the world's oil supplies. Oil, of course, is essential for transport around the world, and that's why there is a major mismatch in supply and demand. And then finally, for gas, North America's gas supply is 18% of the world's, yet it demands 
So again, it demands more than it has as a supply. So it needs to import from all our regions around the world. The Middle East supplies 15%, but it only needs 10%. So actually the Middle East in terms of gas is in a surplus. It is using less gas than it actually has available to it naturally. And finally, Asia has no gas stores, yet it demands 16% of the world's supply. And therefore, places like the Middle East supply Asia with excess gas supply. So they are coal, oil and gas and the mismatch between supply and demand we have today. Now back to energy pathways briefly in terms of fossil fuels this time. There are three main fossil fuel pathways and they are coal, oil and gas. And the first one is coal. And coal mainly comes from six producers, and they include Australia, Indonesia, Russia, South Africa, Colombia, and the USA. And they mainly go to the EU, India, China, and Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. Oil mainly comes from the Middle East, and it goes to the EU, the USA, and the East and Southeast of Asia. And gas comes from the Middle East mainly, and Europe as well, mainly Russia. And we see less, though, coming from Indonesia, Nigeria and Trinidad. But again, remember, the key thing here is even though these pathways are the general traditional ways in which energy moves across the world, some of these uh, nations, some of the lesser producing nations demand more. So have to get it from other nations as well. Now, one of the examples we looked at in lesson was Russian gas to Europe. So Russia is a major supplier of gas to Europe, as previously mentioned. Russia is currently the second largest producer of gas in the world. Most of its production goes to European countries like the UK and Germany and Italy and so on. And there are five pipelines that Russia delivers its gas to Europe through. Now, there are four countries that get 100% of its gas from Russia, and they are Finland, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania in Central Europe. And then Bulgaria, Poland, Czech Republic and Slovakia also receive between 66 and 99 percent of their gas from Russia as well. So the key point with this example is this. Many European nations rely heavily upon Russian gas. Now, let's just think about conflict briefly. You can imagine any Russian conflict with Europe or anywhere else in the world could dramatically impact that gas supply and therefore that could lead to severe consequences for Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Bulgaria, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and also most European nations like the UK and Germany. And so therefore that's why politically and geopolitically there has been a lot of uh, reluctance to challenge Russia on human rights, for example, and other issues in politics due to the resources that Russia can provide us. Now, we also have another unconventional method of obtaining fossil fuel usage. So unconventional fossil fuels are hard to reach energy intensive sources of fuel. So we'll start with this blue table here, and this has the four resource types that are unconventional fossil fuels. Tar sands, oil shale, shale gas and deep water oil. I'm just briefly going to go through what they're like. So tar sands is a mixture of clay, sand and water and also Bitumen, which is like a heavy oil. Oil shale is oil bearing rocks, which is pumped out of through permeable sources. Shale gas is obviously natural glass, which is trapped in shale or fine grained sedimentary rocks. And deep water oil is exactly that. It's oil and gas found in water that is very deep off shore. Now, the examples of this we looked at are on the right hand side here. So. Canadian tar sands, 40% of Canada's oil output is from Canadian tar sands. In 2015, there was a global price decrease which depressed the industry of tar sands. In terms of shale gas, the US, 25% um, of the US's gas supply comes from shale gas in the US. There is a growing use of fracking in the US to frack this shale gas. And fracking in the USA is now key to its energy security. It's one of the ways in which it's able to become more self-sufficient in its energy production and use. And finally, for deep water oil, the 
best example of this is the um, TNC Petrobras extracting 500,000 barrels of oil a day in the Brazilian deep waters. Rigs drill more than 2,000 meters undersea to access the oil. And the biggest problem here is that there is a major risk of oil spills. Now, these unconventional fossil fuels have positive impacts and negative impacts. And you can see them listed on the left-hand side here. So the positive impacts includes things like locals benefiting from upskilling, new jobs, and also it's being able to add to a already existing energy mix to make it more secure and stable. However, there are major negative impacts of using unconventional fossil fuels. One being that it's extremely costly to extract and to use. Secondly, oil spills, accidents and contamination um, events increase. And finally, in the long term, socially on health, health and well-being, we may see negative impacts due to air pollution and water pollution as well. So that's just a brief summary of what unconventional fossil fuels are and what the impacts of them are positively and negatively with some examples as well. We then had in EQ2 the idea of renewable and recyclable energies. So you've got a table on the right there with nuclear, wind and solar power. Now, nuclear power is actually a recyclable energy from its waste. And then wind power and solar power, power are renewable energies. So generating nuclear energy is almost seen as a last option in terms of achieving energy security. Its waste can be recycled, which is why it's a recyclable energy source, which is a benefit, but it comes with many downsides like safety and security risks. The disposal of radioactive waste takes a very long time and is risky. There's complex technology involved. And whilst operationally making nuclear energy, the costs are low operationally, constructing the buildings and decommissioning those buildings are very high in terms of cost. So on the right hand side, just briefly, I've just put together a short table for you of nuclear power, wind power and solar power. The costs of it, in other words, the negative impacts of them and the benefits of them as well. Now, of course, with wind power, one of the negative impacts or negative things about that is that large areas are needed and some people regard them as unsightly. But the positives, of course, are that it is renewable. Uh, there is potential, particularly in a place like the UK, for this. And time profile is favourable as well. So winter has the strongest winds. Usually winter produces the most electricity from wind power. In terms of solar power, obviously summer is best. Um, it can generate large amounts of electricity where there are high levels of sunshine or insulation. So countries in the European continent, the southern European continent, some of Asia, some of South America, can get many benefits out of solar power. And finally, just on this, the UK has seen a shift over the last 50 years from using lots of coal and having its primary energy consumption as being coal towards alternatives like nuclear and renewables. So you can see there the breakdown on a pie chart of the UK's energy mix. And we can see that we actually do have in the UK a good balance between the different types of energy. So nuclear power at 21%, renewables at just under 25%, gas at 30%, coal at 22%, and coal is declining rapidly still. Now, an alternative way of us producing energy today is biofuels. Now, biofuels is when we essentially grow crops that can be burnt and the energy harvested for fuel. So it's essentially the conversion of crop into fuel. And worldwide, this is an increasing alternative to conventional fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas. In the UK, the most common crop for biofuel use is oilseed, rape and sugar beet. One criticism of these biofuels, though, is that it uses agricultural land space, which would usually be used for food production, which is much needed in some parts of the world, especially develop, um, less developed parts of the world. And therefore, if we're using agricultural landscape to produce energy, we are producing less food. And that's therefore not tackling, tackling poverty crises 
and the lack of demand for resources in terms of food worldwide. Now, we did a brief case study on Brazil for this and their use of biofuels. There has been mixed success in Brazil in developing biofuel usage. So 5% of Brazil's energy comes from renewable sources. That's very low. But 90% of its vehicles, so cars, vans, buses, etc., are actually sold with what's called fuel flex engines. So they use both petrol, petrol and ethanol. Now, ethanol comes from biofuel production. So that ethanol is actually made from biofuel. So actually what Brazil has managed to do is reduce its reliance on petrol and increase its reliance on ethanol through the use of biofuels. Now, that's brilliant in terms of reducing CO2 levels. And most of central southern Brazil's landscape is now cultivating sugarcane for the production of this ethanol. But the landscape being used to grow the sugarcane to produce the ethanol has displaced cattle rearing and that has also led to deforestation in the Amazon. And therefore, what's actually happened is, although Brazil has dramatically reduced its fossil fuel usage, it's actually increased its carbon dioxide emissions or replaced the amount it used to have because of deforestation and the moving of cattle to the Amazonian basin. So whilst Brazil has had some success in actually developing biofuels, developing the use of ethanol, producing a high amount of cars and other more forms of transport that use fuel flex petrol engines and ethanol engines. The problem is we've seen increased deforestation due to the amount of land needed to grow biofuel crops. Now, one of the final things in EQ2 to look at is radical technologies to reduce carbon emissions. So these are the radical approaches, the more expensive approaches and the more large scale approaches that we could take. So we have two and they are carbon capture and storage, otherwise known as CCS, and hydrogen fuel cells and electric vehicles. Now, carbon capture and storage essentially just involves capturing the CO2 released by the burning of fossil fuels, burying it deep in underground before it goes into the atmosphere. So that is really positive in that it promises great reductions in CO2 going into the atmosphere. We can virtually capture all of the CO2 before it goes into the atmosphere and bury it deep underground, as you can see in the image on the top right. But it is very, very costly, very high expense to the consumer to be passed on. And there are concerns that the CO2 may over time leak to the surface anyway through the pores of the soil above it. So there are some of the negatives and positives of carrying out CCS. Now, in terms of hydrogen fuel cells, they may be combined with um, oxygen to produce electricity, heat and water. And they produce electricity as long as the hydrogen is supplied and never lose charge, so you have to recharge it. Um, fuel cells can be used as a source of heat for electricity for buildings, for electric vehicles, production of which is increasing. And we know that today, for example, in the UK, in the last five years particularly, the production of and the usage of electric vehicles has dramatically increased. And we know that the UK government has a target of 2040 for all electric vehicles. And we know that the Scottish government is five years before that. So there are steps being taken towards this electric vehicle future. And the idea that we can all use electric vehicles as an alternative to petrol and diesel powered motors to try and reduce the amount of uh, nitrogen oxide, carbon dioxide and so on being produced and going into the atmosphere. So that is a roundup briefly of EQ2 and the idea of the effects on the environment and people of using carbon dioxide um, and also burning fossil fuels. The next EQ will look at the carbon and water cycle and how they're linked to climate. Please do use this jog pod again if you need to to go back over it and please do visit the next one after you've watched this video in full again and hopefully you found it useful.